Good, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, I would like to welcome you to this webinar about private equity impact on nuclear cardiology and lab modernization. My name is Moaz Malah. I'm the president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, and I'm from Houston Methodist. And I'm honored to be sharing the stage with a elite group that will be presenting on the different aspects of this topic. Uh, we'll start introducing them now shortly, and then we will discuss later on in details their contribution to this topic. Uh, Dr. Mr. Gardner Armsby, Armsby, he's a senior associate at King and Spalding. Dr. Tim Attlebury, he is the Chief Executive Officer of Cardiovascular Associates of America. Dr. George Basso, he is the Chief Medical Officer at the Houston Cardiovascular Associates. And Eric Major, he is the Managing Director at Provident Healthcare Partners. So why is this webinar? There have been a lot of topics, a lot of interest in this topic from our members and from different colleagues that have asked a lot of questions about this. And this is kind of a new paradigm that started a few years ago across different specialties in, uh, in medicine and healthcare. And you can see which states it's affecting mostly, mostly in the southern part of the United States. This is data in general, but in, the, in cardiology, this it's mostly affecting Arizona, Texas, Florida, Oklahoma, and Iowa. I will see more up-to-date data. This data is from 2020. And there have been a lot of changes in terms of healthcare uh, practice management and practices in these uh, areas. And that's why we thought an informational webinar to our members about and our colleagues about what kind of impact this will have on lab modernization and the practice of nuclear cardiology is important. We have been telling our members that we need to modernize our labs and adopt these uh, innovations in cardiology. I've presented this slide a few times before and I would like to bring to your attention that there have been a lot of changes in nuclear cardiology, including introduction of cardiac PET, hybrid imaging with CT attenuation correction and calcium scoring. There are a lot of new cameras and new tracers and a lot of new artificial intelligence tools that can be applied in our practice. We also have inflammation and infection imaging, myocardial blood flow assessment with PET mainly, but also with SPEC, and also amyloid imaging. What would bring having private equities backed practices? How would that impact the adoption of these new innovations in your practice? That's going to be the topic of our discussion today. And that this is how we will be going over in the coming hour or in the coming hour. Initially, we'll have few presentations uh, by different uh, speakers, uh, mostly uh, intro introducing the topic. And then we will go ahead and have a live discussion. And you're more than welcome to put in your questions through the Q&A button that you see on, the, on your screen and we will get these uh, questions and uh, uh, pass it over to the panel. So we'll start with Mr. Eric Major. He's from Provident Health, and Eric is a managing director at Providence Healthcare and has been with the firm since 2012. He supports deal, or, uh, deal origination and execution for multi-site uh, based business based on the mostly rehabilitation and surgical care. He's active throughout the process from pre-market diligence, overseeing the creation of marketing materials, supporting the marketing process, and also bringing the deal to closure. He has been a frequent speaker at healthcare conferences, including uh, different conferences all through the United States and American Society of Cataract and other professional organizations. 
and he's going to talk to us about why is the private healthcare equity now interested in healthcare and what would that bring to the field of the practice of cardiology and imaging. Eric? Great, thank you, and, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to participate in the webinar. Um, so as noted, Providence uh, an Investment Bank, so we advise uh, healthcare businesses through these types of private equity transactions and spend most of our time working with physician owners. So we're engaged in the process to help physician owners evaluate what their options are in terms of aligning with private equity firms or other strategic groups. Um, so cardiology, obviously, we're, we're seeing a lot more interest and activity in the market. I'm sure folks, uh, attendees are, are you know, getting inbound interest from, um, from different private equity firms. So I'll pull up a couple slides here just to talk a little bit about what we're seeing in the market. Um, you know, I think just taking a step back for people that maybe are less familiar with private equity, you know, the way that these firms work is they raise a pool of capital from institutions, you know, endowment funds and pension plans, as an example, and then they invest this money into privately held businesses. And there's usually about a 10 year life cycle on these funds. So they'll spend about half of that life cycle investing into privately held businesses. Then they'll spe spend the other half of that life cycle recouping their investment. So really their vision and their goal is to invest into a privately held business, help grow that business over a period of, you know, typically four to seven years, and then look at that point to monetize their investment and, you know, return that, that, um, that return on invested capital back to the institutions that invested into their fund. Um, so these are, you know, companies that aren't, you know, targeting the public markets. They're generally going to be focused on the private markets. You know, cardiology as a specialty is seeing a lot of private equity interests over the last couple of years. You know, if you if you look at the physician landscape as a whole, in the last you know 10 to 15 years, private equity firms have started to invest into physician specialties at an accelerated rate. Um, cardiology, you know, is one of the newer specialties to start to see private equity activity. And there's a few different factors that we're seeing that are driving that, which we highlight on this slide. Uh, obviously, there's a big shift from, you know, inpatient to outpatient care, which is driving a lot of, you know, volume in the outpatient setting, which investors really like to get behind, you know, the, the patient demand. And I think patients are obviously needing these services and they're increasingly happen in the, you know, happening in the outpatient setting. You know, within cardiology, there's a lot of opportunity to invest into new tech technology and ancillary services. So, Obviously, the theme of here is being, you know, more on the, the nuclear side, you know, pet imaging is an opportunity that a lot of practices are, are looking at pursuing if they don't have it today. These can be very expensive capital expenditures for small practices in particular. You know, private equity firms want to provide capital to practices to allow them to grow and make sure they're investing into the latest technology, um, you know, providing the best quality patient care. There's also a big opportunity in cardiology to move more into value-based care contracting, which is a big theme across the healthcare space. As a smaller private practice, it's very difficult to move into something that looks like value-based care because there's a lot of you know, nuance to it. There's a lot of data that's needed. Um, and these private equity firms are partnering with organizations, you know, bringing in individuals that can help you know, position uh, a cardiology practice to move to more of a value-based care contracting model. Um, with obviously the, the theme being high quality patient care in the outpatient setting is going to save payers pretty significant dollars. And they want, you know, private cardiology practices to benefit from that. It's also a very fragmented industry. So, you know, private equity firms like to invest into a market that's highly fragmented, especially the outpatient setting in, in cardiology. There's a lot of smaller practices and, you know, there's a lot of efficiencies that you can gain by bringing some of these, you know, high quality practices together under a certain, you know, under an umbrella with a, a private equity investor. Um, and then obviously there's a big opportunity in the sector, depending on the state that you're in, to invest into OBLs and ASCs, uh, depending on the certificate of need laws within those states. All that being said, you know, the chart on the right here shows there's been increasing activity within the cardiology sector, particularly in the last two years. So we saw in 2022, 20, 20, there were about 18 total transactions within cardiology, five of which were new private equity firms making their first investment in the sector. And then 13 were practices that joined an existing private equity backed organization. Um, and that's obviously up substantially from 2021 and 2020 when we started to see that activity happening in the, in the sector as a whole. Um, and then, you know, summarizing the, the market today. So you know, there's about 12 different private equity firms that have invested into cardiology to date. And you can see on the right here, we list the private equity firms that have made investments so far. And, you know, these are the, the management companies that they've formed. So 
the way private equity firms typically work is they'll create a management entity that you'll never see on a building. And then they'll have practices that will fall under that management entity while preserving their local brands. So they're not coming in and trying to push a new brand on the practice. They want to make sure that what's worked for you all, you know, the brand that you've created in your market, which could be decades or several decades in existence, they want to preserve that brand, but they'll create sort of this management entity that provides some back office support services to the practices that, that they partner with. So you'll see that on the map here, there's been you know, a number of states now that have seen private equity um, platforms formed and other transaction activity. It is largely concentrated so far in sort of the South. And part of that is, you know, Texas, Arizona, Florida are not, you know, don't require certificate of needs for surgery centers. So that, ten that tends to be an attractive market for private equity firms, given there's an opportunity to build ASCs, um, you know, in those markets. So, you know, we're starting to see that activity take hold. It's very early innings on this consolidation. We'd expect a lot of states in the next, you know, three to four years, we'll see private equity firms, you know, partner with, different, with practices of different size and scale. And on the bottom here, we just outline, you know, some of the resources that the groups, these groups bring to the table. I'd say the investors so far that have closed deals in cardiology, the names listed here, all have really good experience partnering with physicians. So, Part of your you know, consideration as a physician is making sure you align with the right organization, with the right team that you that you view is you know, going to allow your practice to grow and, and culturally aligns with you know, your, your organization. So part of the process you, know, you have to look at as a physician is making sure that you, know, you vet options because um, you know, all these groups are very well qualified and their private equity firms have really good experience across physician practice uh, investing. Um, so it's just making sure that you align with the right organization that sees the eye to eye with your physician leadership and management team. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. That was a good introduction to the topic. And at this time, we'll move on to Mr. Gardner Armsby. He is the uh, senior associate in Kings and Spalding and Atlanta office, and he's a member of the firm's healthcare practice. And he's gonna his practice focus on representation of healthcare industry clients in the merger and acquisition. So, Mr. Gardner, can you tell us about some of the legal challenges or aspects of this as physicians may be going through some of these transactions? Yes. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you to everybody who's joined us here this evening. Um, as Moa said, I'm Gardner Armsby, and I'm with the law firm of King and Spalding. I've done a lot of deals uh, in the healthcare space involving physician practice acquisitions, both on buy side, uh, representing the private equity investors, uh, and also on the sell side where I've been working uh, with the physician practice as my client. Um, I'm going to talk first about the, the way these acquisitions are generally structured and the implications that that structure is going to have on your practice going forward after the acquisition. Uh, because of state law restrictions against the corporate practice of medicine, uh, which exist in most states, the acquisitions have to be carefully structured. Um, corporate practice restrictions vary a lot from state to state, but the general requirement is that the equity owners of the medical practice have to be persons who are licensed physicians. And unlicensed persons and entities, uh, such as private equity funds, are generally prohibited from owning direct interests in medical practices. So what uh, has sort of developed over the last few decades is a, a, a manner for these investors to indirectly invest and sort of indirectly own and control practices uh, through what's called the friendly PC arrangement. PC stands for a professional corporation. That's sort of shorthand for the physician practice entity. The, it can also be an LLC or some other entity, but we generally say PC. So the investors will own equity in the MSO, which is a, a management services organization, which Eric was uh, referring to a minute ago. And when the deal goes through, the MSO will buy the non-clinical practice assets from the PC, uh, generally for cash and some rollover equity that the physicians will get in the MSO. And when I say non-clinical assets, I mean basically everything that you know is tangible that that can be owned by an unlicensed person. Um, and the end result is the PC continues to exist and it continues to employ the physicians uh, and they will enter into new employment agreements, uh, but it doesn't own any 
tangible assets anymore. Most of those will reside at the MSO level. And then the MSO will enter into a management agreement with the PC, and that agreement will provide for the MSO to basically control the administrative aspects of the practice and be paid a management fee that equals all the profits generally of the a managed practice. And then the selling physicians will transfer their equity uh, to a friendly physician who's chosen by the MSO and will be the owner of the PC. Sometimes that friendly physician will be one of the selling physicians. Uh, other times it will be someone who's already affiliated with the private equity fund. And that physician will be under an equity transfer restriction agreement that will restrict them from selling their shares in the practice and will uh, uh, provide a mechanism for the MSO to replace them as the owner of the practice, um, usually at will. Um, so what this creates is basically a bundle of contractual rights that give the private equity sponsor uh, via their ownership of the MSO that has these rights, the ability to control the practice as if it were a wholly owned subsidiary subject to certain limitations under the corporate practice uh, corporate practice of medicine laws. So what are the implications of this for those of you who are considering a deal? Um, first, you need to understand that the PE sponsor is generally buying the business and the MSO is not just a vendor. So don't just assume that because you've retained equity ownership of the practice that you're going to be in the driver's seat. They will have contractual rights to be able to make decisions for you. Also understand that the management agreement and your employment agreement should give you authority over clinical decisions. Uh, that's necessary to comply with corporate practice restrictions, but that's not a, an unlimited sort of authority. You're going to be subject to a lot of practical limitations such as the budget uh, that the MSO is going to control and also their ability to replace you as the equity holder if you're the friendly physician. So to the extent you are looking to have a say in the post-closing operations of the practice and you want to, you know, get the private equity fund or other acquirer to commit to, you know, your vision for uh, modernizing your lab and, you know, your, your vision for clinical care, you need to negotiate for contractual commitments uh, in your employment agreement uh, and your management agreement and the other deal documents um, and not just you know, take the, the, the sponsor at their word. Um, you know, the sponsor at some point may exit and you may have a new sponsor who won't necessarily share that vision. So things like CapEx commitments, governance and consent rights, those things you will want to have memorialized in all of the deal documents. So those are the, sort of at a high level, uh, the, the main structuring issues that you need to think of as you're beginning to go into a transaction. And with that, I'll turn it back to Moaz. Thanks, uh, Gardner. And uh, at this time, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Tim Atterbury. He is very well known to us from his prior role at the American College of Cardiology. He is currently the CEO of Cardiovascular Services of America, which he founded with Webster Equity Partners in 2021. Uh, before that, he was the CEO of the American College of Cardiology and Medaxium, and before that, he served as uh, in multiple administrator levels and CEO of different uh, medical practices and medical centers. He has educational background. He has an MBA from University of Tennessee and a doctoral degree in healthcare leadership. And he's going to give us more of an administrator kind of perspective of this, specifically focusing on cardiac imaging and what would what are the positives and negatives of such a model for cardiac imaging? Tim? Thank you, and thanks uh, to ASNIC for inviting me to speak. This is an exciting time for cardiology. Uh, so I just some general uh, thoughts for the audience to consider. I think the we know that independent cardiology practices are always under financial pressure. It seems that every year CMS comes up with a new way to put the squeeze on the necks of cardiologists and the cardiovascular enterprise. So I think the opportunity to partner with private equity, you may want to consider that, and I appreciate what Gardner was talking about in terms of memorializing some of the, the key issues about investments. Consider this an opportunity to refresh investments 
and imaging across the practice. In many cases, uh, groups are dealing with maybe older equipment or older hardware. Now, this is an opportunity working with private equity to refresh and update. And particularly, I think around the strategy of a multimodality approach to serving patients in your markets. And I think uh, knowing that there are so many things happening around advanced tomographic imaging, PET, CT, and MR, I think it's important to look at the partnership with pro private equity as a way to kind of create the cardiovascular center and cardiovascular imaging of the future. And if there are any gaps in your current operations, this is an opportunity to close those gaps. I think the other couple other fine points is uh, certainly there are uh, resources that private equity can bring to improve the financial performance of the practice. Uh, obviously, a lot of cardiology groups have done well over the years to stay independent and deal with all the headwinds, but there are usually things they could do better. And I think when it comes to imaging, just a couple of thoughts for the, uh, again, for the audience to think about. Uh, most of the time, especially with cardiac PET, we don't have wide adoption among some of the commercial payers. This is where I think we can bring in the leverage of private equity and other resources that the private equity firms can bring to help those groups that are partnering to go to those commercial payers and try to negotiate reimbursement arrangements, particularly for cardiac pet, which I think you know, lags in certain markets around the country where commercial payers will not reimburse for cardiac pet, or at least won't reimburse at the level they should. But there's also, I think, opportunities for private equity and the network of groups around the country that private equity is building to uh, create better efficiency, to lower your cost of operations through leveraging around uh, purchasing capital, capital equipment, uh, labor cost, throughput. How do you optimize radioisotopes and the systems that you're using for getting patients through the lab? I know in many cases, labs are operating maybe thinking they're operating at VMAX doing X number of cases per day, only to find out with a few uh, workflow changes, they can increase that X to X plus two or three patients per day and create a, a better revenue stream at a lower cost per case. Uh, then last, I think it's important for all of us in cardiology, and I've been in cardiology on the business side for 33 uh, years now, and I think it's exciting to think about we're finally entering a world where we can start legitimately talking about the total cost of care and the way that advanced imaging can favorably impact the total cost of care. So instead of arguing about what to pay for a cardiac pet, let's leverage the good information about cardiac pet to show that we can reduce the number of diagnostic ads that we can actually save on the total cost of care. And to do that, private equity platforms are going to need to invest significantly into data collection to be able to demonstrate that across the network and then turn that into value-based care and risk-based care arrangements. So all around, I think, to think of the private equity partnerships as a transaction first, but long-term it's a partnership. It's a partnership that sometimes I like to look at as if money were no object, and it always is, but if money were no object, what would you like to do to refresh and improve and modernize your operations and I think in this case, private equity can bring you those solutions under the appropriate terms. So I'll uh, pause there and then we can move on. Thank you. Thanks, Tim, uh, for this introduction. And uh, finally, from the uh, introducing remarks, we'll have Dr. George Basso. Uh, Dr. Basso is a pri uh, practicing cardiologist here in Houston. He's a chief medical officer of Houston Cardiovascular Associates, and he's been heavily involved with this model, uh, private equity model, for several years. His practice was among the first or uh, probably the largest that was acquired in the Houston market. And he's going to tell us about his physician expo experience and its impact on their uh, practice from an imaging standpoint, uh, especially cardiac, nuclear cardiology and cardiac PET. Dr. Basso? Thanks, Moaz. And... Uh... Thanks again for uh, hosting this as well as inviting me to participate. Um, this is a very active time in cardiology with private equity uh, coming on the scene over the last few years and really making a splash. Um, in 2019, my 
private practice group of 17 partners, uh, Houston Cardiovascular, was approached by private equity. And um, it, was, it was something that intrigued us because we had some financial challenges. Although we were all doing well, there were opportunities that were unavailable to us, uh, specifically advanced imaging, access to other modalities like an ambulatory surgical center, but also just simply recruitment and trying to compete with uh, hospitals uh, that have much deeper pockets than a, than a private practice. That was, uh, that was one of the things that sort of prompted us to pursue the evaluation of, of going through a private equity uh, transaction. Uh, we took our time. We, we, we realized that not all private equity firms are created uh, the same and, and not all have the same idea as to where they wanna go. Uh, and what they want to do with your practice. And that's an important thing. It also depends on where you geographically reside. Texas is very different than uh, say somewhere like New York. Um, imaging, uh, ambulatory surgical centers, those are very important components of where we're trying to uh, drive our practice as well, where we're trying to drive the practice of cardiology in general. Um, there's, there's a massive shift of patients going from inpatient management to outpatient. Obviously, we have seen in the past, not only from outpatient cath labs, but just our imaging center, I think we do very well, uh, not only in patient's experience, but also the delivery of care to the patients um, from a cost standpoint. So, you know, to, to focus on what our, our topic is tonight, um, the, the private equity relationship that we've had over the last uh, year and now one month has been very beneficial. We have on the horizon uh, the, the, the platform uh, that's helped us get a PET CT program in, in the pipeline that should be up and running within the, you know, in the coming few months. Already some of our other nuclear um, imaging modalities that we have, specifically our spec machines and PET machines, as we have scaled to not only our 17 man group, but we are now 45 guys in Houston and another 60 in Dallas, we are getting better rates with some of the vendors, not only from the PET and PET CT machines, but also with Brocco and who's providing our radioactive tracers. So the relationship with private equity has helped on that standpoint, certainly some of the costs of managing a uh, private practice, we've seen reductions in costs there as well. Um, there's this, this massive confluence of things happening with the opportunity to sort of preserve the entrepreneurial cardiologist and get them at, from fellowship or existing private practices that are, that are very, very challenged and give them the financial support to participate. You know, a group like ours did have PET before private equity came on the block and now the, the, the emergence of private equity to perhaps consolidate or group uh, physicians together is going to allow smaller private practices access to things like ASCs and certainly um, nuclear imaging. Nuclear imaging, specifically PET and PET-CT, are something that, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Atterbury had mentioned. You know, when you're talking about the total cost of care to a patient. You know, historically, especially when we were a little smaller, we would have a spec scan, like you know, likely a false positive study. Uh, the patient would go to the cath lab, totally normal coronaries. That that ends up costing the system more. Um, when we kind of look at that and say you go to a much more functional study like a PET with the component of CT giving you flow, you're getting physiologic anatomic uh, information that is going to be much more cost effective you know, for, the, for the healthcare system. So um, with that, I'll, I'll also stop. I think um, it, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to really look into the, 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 the labs that people have are very, very stuck because these are very expensive machines to try to gain access to. And this is a, this is a great way of getting great uh, technology to all the physicians that are in private practice right now. All right. Thanks, Dr. Basso. And uh, if I may ask the panelists to turn on their camera and we'll start taking questions. 
for the audience, you can put in your questions uh, through the um, uh, the Q&A and we'll take them one after the other. I just want to mention that from American Society of Nuclear Cardiology perspective, we're not taking a position on the best path for cardiologists, which way they want to practice, but rather more educating our members and uh, promoting the dialogue on this topic. And ASNIC is here really to support you and whatever model works for different colleagues in different parts of the country, then that would be the best whatever works for them. But we're here bringing this to, uh, this dialogue really to educate our members about what would be the uh, options and what's been happening here, especially around the issue of modernizing our labs and enhancing our ability to image our patients. So there is a first question that we'll answer live here. Maybe I'll open it up to Dr. Basso and uh, Tim and maybe the... Uh, Eric and Gardner can also pitch in. What are the downsides of backed up? Like it's so far you presented it in a very positive way, uh, maybe from a physician standpoint or from an administrator standpoint, what are the downsides? And obviously Gardner can pitch in on the, he already alluded to some of the issues from the legal standpoint. So George. Sure, yeah, no, thank you. You know, the downsides of any sort of change in your relationship is we are doing something uh, the way we've been doing it for a long time. My, my, my group's been around for almost 50 years. I haven't, but uh, the, 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 the traditions and uh, the mode of practice have all been in place. And so as you partner, not only with someone who's um, bringing a, a wallet to the, to, the, to the situation, but also as you partner with other practices that fall under the umbrella, you have to make some adjustments and and frankly i look at it and it is all about your attitude towards it i look at it as an opportunity to share best best practices you know what is another practice doing that's frankly better than what what we are or you know, you know educate another practice on uh, on tools modalities you know some of our some of our existing um physicians have uh, have learned how to do vein and vein technology, but we have introduced to some of the smaller groups that have joined, you know, educating them on SPECT, um, the newer, the newer um, software and the acquisition have allowed us to do more SPECT. And so we're bringing that and delivering that to other uh, smaller physician groups. And then there are small physician groups that have not had any access to PET at all. And so uh, we're sharing some of our education as well as uh, technology. So you know the downside is that you're 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 having to kind of hold everybody's hand but you have to look at the upside which is collectively you're going to do better financially as well as qualitatively you're going to fall under compliance which is also another uh, huge important thing tim um just a couple of thoughts uh, first uh just a reminder, I always tell cardiology groups when I'm talking to them, cardiology groups and cardiologists are always going to be busy. They're always going to make a living. This is not a choice of life or death. Uh, this is looking at the future and trying to be strategic. Uh, I think one downside I would remind everybody just to think about is it's a permanent decision. That you don't go into this with an unwind. You go in and it's a permanent decision. And you have to go in with your eyes wide open as uh, Dr. Basu and his group did and other groups that we know. You have to be very circumspect who you're partnering with, but realize that you don't go in with an unwind. There's no prenuptials, and we'll just unwind this thing in three years. If, you, if you're not happy, you will have to leave the area, whatever that non-competer definition is. So I think just be mindful of that. And then secondly, I would remind everybody autonomy. I know how much physicians uh, highly respect and, and, uh, and want to protect uh, their autonomy and different PE firms may handle that differently, and Gardner gave some really good advice when he was speaking, but just be careful about your autonomy. Yeah, I'd further that comment from Tim. I think, you know, Dr. Basu and Tim are aligned with two very smart, sophisticated private equity firms that have worked with physician groups before and, and done this in other specialties. And, you know, on the flip side, there's a lot of private equity firms that we run into that are interested in cardiology that don't really know what they're doing. They don't have experience 
partnering with physicians. And, you know, the downside is if you do the deal with an investor that's maybe, you know, tells you all the, the things you want to hear, but doesn't have a track record and, and tries to throw some big price in front of you, those are the deals that you should probably run away from. So I think it's making sure that, you know, you're, you're aligning with the right people. Uh, like I think the panelists have. Yeah, I don't have much to add on top of that. I think the, the potential downside is loss of control um, and, and the time commitment. Um, and, you know, you can negotiate around those to an extent and get some protections. Um, but you're, you know, you're getting paid a lot of money for, for, for what you're selling. And that comes uh, with some strings attached. So just go into it eyes wide open. Okay, so one other question, and Trevor is expert on this. So after some years, the practice could be sold from one private equity firm to another. And what kind of implications that will have on the practice itself? Maybe Eric can. Yeah, yeah, I can start. So that's that's correct. So I mean, if you think about private equity firms, as we talked about in the beginning, they you know they have this you know mandate where pension funds and endowment funds are putting, you know, dollars into these firms and the expectation is they're going to generate a return for them over a 10 year life cycle. So these private equity firms, you know, are, you know, there's some exceptions to it, but most are going to seek to realize their investment at some point in time. And that can be, you know, anywhere from four to seven years or maybe longer for some, you know, groups that are more family offices. Um, I think what's important to understand is when these private equity firms first make an investment, they're generally going to be very hands-on and, you know, they're going to help think about who do we need to hire from a management team perspective to help this business grow from 15 physicians to 150, right? There's going to be certain human capital that they'll need to help recruit in order to help that business grow. What's important is that you have to distinguish between the private equity firm and that management team. That management team can, you know, be in place for decades, right? These can be individuals that continue to oversee the operations of the of the company well beyond the hold period of these private equity firms. So, you know, these groups are building businesses that are meant to last well beyond their investment horizon. So, you know, whether it's Webster and, and CBA USA, who Tim works with, you know, at some point Webster might look to realize their investment, but you know, if they do their jobs right over that several year period, they'll build a company that's going to continue to run itself, you know, regardless of the next investor that comes in. Um, the other big thing with private equity is oftentimes, you know, they're going to, you know, partner with a larger private equity firm when they're looking to exit. So a lot of the groups that are investing so far in cardiology are sort of smaller private equity firms that, you know, maybe manage a billion dollars or are a couple exceptions to that. Um, in the PE world, that's pretty small potatoes. You know, there's a lot larger private equity firms that are managing tens of billions, you know, dollars of, of capital. And those are the types of investors that could be acquirers for some of these groups, you know, 10 years down the road. Um, so it is very rare that these groups are going to, you know, seek a, an IPO, an initial public offering when they want to exit. Oftentimes, they're aligning with much larger private equity firms that will continue to, you know, take that uh, group on the same trajectory that it had on the first seven years of their investment. I think that's a very important thing that Eric brings up, and I'll just sort of highlight why that was important to us. You know, we 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 chose to partner with a private equity firm that was very large. You know, Eric had mentioned some are smaller in the you know one or two billion dollar range, which is sounds like a lot of money to a cardiologist, but you know, our partner is you know in the three hundred billion dollar range and thirty five billion dollars in healthcare. They're, they're conceptually different. And this was one of the reasons we went along with this is that their companies that they've run in healthcare before, including dental, primary care, OBGYM and der dermatology, they, they've held on to those companies for anywhere from nine to 17 years. So conceptually, that was something that we were very against was the concept of being bought and sold and treated like a widget was something that we categorically didn't want to do. And so we partnered with somebody who's going to build and hold a company. And because they're so big, they kind of sell it internally, which essentially keeps the entire management and strategic team together for a lot longer period of time. So a very important question that you asked, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it. Okay. Up. So a couple of questions came like, can you clarify some terms, PC, MSO, and CIN? Maybe Eric or Gardner. I can 
take the, the first shot at that. So PC is sort of a general term we use to refer to the physician practice. It's, it stands for professional corporation. Um, you know, it's the legal entity that, you know, the physicians own and that employs the physicians. And that, you know, is the, the medicine is practiced through that entity. MSO is a management services organization. That is the entity that the private equity fund uh, or, the, or another investor will own, and that uh, typically manages the PC and then gets paid the management, uh, a, a management fee from the PC, and that's how the investors are able to extract the, the profits from the practice. And then a CIN is sort of a, a separate concept. It's a clinically integrated network, and that is involves, a, a, it's sort of a contractual co collaboration among um, a hospital, one or more hospitals, and um, different provider groups, and they sort of uh, band together to do uh, like joint contracting with payors. Uh, and there, there can be like a PE-owned practice uh, or a PE-managed practice can be a participant in a SIN. Um, it's, sometimes the hospitals don't like it, but it's, it's a possibility. So one question I want to ask to George and Tim, like as you are going into these larger groups and you mentioned that George, your group now has grown up to almost 45 uh, physicians and now you're offering newer modalities, especially like a nuclear cardiology PET. How do you ensure that the quality is there? How do you ensure that patient first manage, patient first imaging is happening? That the patient is getting the right tests and not because now we have this new tool. How do you ensure the quality? Because there are probably newer physicians who have not used PET before and you want to ensure that the PET is done right, reported right, uh, myocardial blood flow if measured and assessed. Uh, what have you done in your practices to educate the newer physicians who did not have PET before but joined your group about PET and other imaging modalities there? Sure. Um, you know, we have pr prided ourselves on always having ICANAL certification. Um, there are in the periphery some practices that can somehow skirt some of the I don't want to say legal, but certainly the quality measures that uh, are in place um, feel that everyone who's coming on board has to go through appropriate training, not only with our with our um, uh, vendors, but also with the now three different radiation safety officers that we have, and we 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 expect a period of time where there's going to be overreading and um, ensuring that patient selection as to why you're going with SPECT, why are you going with PET or versus PET CT, those decisions have to be sort of clinically vetted. So we have this sort of uh, period of time where someone who's adopting a new modality has to, has to show some proficiency in their decision making. Um, that's, that's not only looked at by our clinical governance board, but specifically the radiation safety officers of our, of our practices. Tim, like, how do you ensure also that the physicians are ordering the appropriate tests in other ways? Like maybe the private equity, like obviously for different reasons, they have one modality and the physician leadership want, let's say PET, or they don't have MRI or whatever modality there. How do you ensure that the physicians kind of negotiate it right and make sure that they have access to what's appropriate to their practice? And to their uh, um, right, yeah, I think, First, first, maybe a reminder, especially for cardiac pet, it's carrier priced and carrier regulated. Uh, instead of, there's no NCD at the national uh, level. So I just say that because in some cases you have to couple clinical appropriateness or patient selection with what the MAC, the Medicare Administrative uh, uh, Contractor will cover for that particular area. So one way to do that, as George uh, was talking about uh, this is, is to try to embed some of these appropriate use criteria and use uh, clinical decision support tools at the point of care. Uh, so we, we've seen that done effectively so that physicians don't have to do the guesswork. Essentially, you become your own, I'll use this term and nobody throw anything at me here, but you become your, your own internal RBM. Instead of relying upon the RBM uh, for, uh, you know, for approval and pre-cert, pre pre-auth, you do that internally. Uh, so I think, uh, 
keep in mind that in in our case, and I think it's the case with with uh, uh, with Aries and U.S. Heart and Vascular, the, the physicians have the clinical autonomy to still make those decisions and to regulate and oversee themselves uh, for appropriateness and quality. However, we want to be able to demonstrate with outcomes uh, that we at the national level are holding true to, we think, what is in the best interest of patients for the right test at the right time. And this is where we want to uh, aggregate clinical outcomes data and other data so we can demonstrate and push back to each group how well they're performing when it comes to appropriate use criteria and the, and the choosing of the best test for the, for the patient at the right time. All right, so this is like these are all very important. So a couple more questions that are in the Q and A. I see them, like uh, let's say the CON states, and what are you guys like at the national level trying to do to ensure that patients in these uh, states also have access to the modern technology without going through the hurdles of CON? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to take this one because CON is. Uh... It should be a four-letter word instead of a three-letter <laughs> acronym. Uh, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's disappointing that the CON becomes the rate-limiting factor for what's best for patients. And this is where I think all cardiology, the house of cardiology, the house of nuclear cardiology, and all private equity-sponsored companies should be together, that we should seek to remove that hurdle, but at the same time commit to the regulators and to payers and the patients that we will demonstrate that we're doing the right thing uh, for patients. Unfortunately, CON is a state regulated issue, not federal. So you have to take this on a case by case basis. Uh, Georgia and a few other states uh, that I'm familiar with, particularly the Southeast states are very difficult to deal with. Some states uh, like Rhode Island, that you can't even get a CON for a pet. It is a designated service that only hospitals can get approval for it. Yeah, so we we need to be very vocal. ASNIC, ACC, and others need to be very vocal. The most effective and efficient way for patients to be cared for for cardiovascular disease is by the cardiologists, not the hospitals, not the payers, not the government. And unless we stand up and make our voice heard, these blocks will continue. But I am confident that there are certain states that have already changed some of their rules and CON is going away or getting relaxed and certain states that didn't allow PCI outside the hospital, like Michigan and Pennsylvania and other places, it's happening. We just gotta keep the pressure on. All right, any other words from Eric or Gardner regarding this issue? Because this is a hot issue. I know Gardner, you're in Georgia. Do you see that as a hurdle for adopting newer technology and especially cardiac pet and practices? Yeah, in Georgia, there's um, actually some current litigation going on uh, involving, this is in the orthopedic space, but um, the ability of a PE-backed uh, practice to take advantage of a certain um, exception under the CON laws. Um, the, you know, you, you approach it by trying to very carefully uh, lawyer your way around the regulations and, you know, get the regulators on your side where there's some ambiguity. But in a lot of states, it, it comes down to you need to call the lobbyist and, and try and get them to, to change the law. Yeah, I, I just say generally, obviously, there's a lot of certificate of need barriers that you run into across many states. You know, I know Virginia, for example, you can't get pet as well. You need a certificate of need for that. Um, I think, you know, just speaking about private equity in general, you know, they're not going to be able to come in and change CON laws overnight. But to Tim's point, you know, part of the strategy is aligning with more practices in a state. You know, you have a little bit more, you know, but you have a lot of voice when you have more physicians, you know, that are under a single, you know, umbrella in a state, for example. Um, obviously, private equity firms will, you know, typically align with the best lawyers, you know, that can help, you know, accelerate any of those conversations if it, if it comes down to more legal discussions. Um, and, you know, they'll tap into their Rolodex if they have any, you know, contacts at, you know, maybe there's a health system in your market that's part of a larger, you know, national health system. Maybe there's some contacts that they can, you know, work in order to get you in front of the right people. You know, same thing on the payer side as well. So, you know, it's about sort of their relationships, 
you know, their resources that they can bring in order to work with you all to navigate those CON laws. But it's not a, you know, it's not an immediate solution that an investor can solve for. It's just a, a, a longer term strategy they'll have to work with you on. Excellent. So uh, there is a question that came out. Any legal minefields to avoid? And maybe Gardner, you're the best to answer that. Yeah, I guess, uh, you know, make sure you have competent legal counsel who, uh, you know, and make sure that you, your arrangements comply with corporate practice of medicine restrictions. That's more of an investor issue. But if, if the whole thing blows up, it comes back on you as a physician because you're probably going to have a sizable amount of rollover in the MSO. And, and you know, if the whole thing blows up because it's illegal, uh, your rollover is not going to be worth anything. Uh, and then other than that, um, Stark uh, is still a factor and an anti-kickback statute. You need to make sure your legal counsel's vetting your employment agreement, making sure that it com complies with applicable exception um, so that you don't uh, end up in hot water there. I think those are the two biggest issues. So a question to Dr. Basu. Um, are there anything like now being like 13 months or so into this uh, deal that you would think that you want to know a little bit more about this topic, especially from an imaging standpoint or uh, any advice you give it to people who are who may be considering such transactions? Sure. Um, from an imaging standpoint, I think maybe the conversation specifically with you know, whomever your, uh, your, your discussions are going with, you know, what is the real pathway uh, to getting newer imaging modalities? What is going to be the ownership structure um, between either PET, PET CT, um, and ASC? What, um, you know, when you talk about the, the, the program on a larger uh, sort of platform, like Gardner had talked about as well as Eric, you really need to know a lot about your partner's track record. You need good legal counsel to walk you through these different, um, you know, thoughts that may come to you. It's a long process to to go through what we call diligence. I mean, we thought, hey, we decided to do this process in September, and it was December 31st when everything was finally vetted. And it, it's it's taking your current practice and then changing it into something that can be uh, grouped together in a compliant fashion, it, it takes a lot. And so um, just be prepared and, and, and also recognize that, um, you know, like Tim had mentioned, you shouldn't go into it with this you know, mindset of, hey, I'm going to do this, I'm going to have a transaction, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to get out. That, you know, no cardiologist wants to be in that situation where they have to give up their practice after a few years. You want to go into a situation, you know, fully energized, enthusiastic, and you want to make, be successful with your financial partner also being successful because it, it's important. And so it's kind of, um, you know, I, I think it's important to know what you're doing um, with, with, with all aspects, financials you know, legal, as well as chart quality and, and compliance. Okay, I know that uh, there was a question about what is rollover. I know, Tim, you answered it in writing, but maybe for everyone else to hear the answer. So what's rollover? Sure, so the term rollover, and I know Eric and uh, Gardner may, may correct me on this, but think of the, the purchase price. Some of the purchase price is paid in cash, and in some transactions that's paid up front, that or in other transactions that may be paid over a few years. But the other part of the purchase price is in rolled over equity. Essentially, you're saying, I'm going to receive X amount of purchase price, and a part of that I get in cash, the capital gains, and then the other part of that is rolled over equity into the national company. So everybody becomes an owner, which I think, by the way, is another principle that I would just remind it's essential that every cardiologist be an owner of the entity. Now, we don't want W-2 employees like the hospitals have. We want owners who have a skin in the game. And the skin in the game is what? Equity. And so everybody gets rolled over equity by uh, equal to whatever portion of the purchase price is not paid in cash. 
And one more question, and probably to you and anyone else on the panel. You mentioned before about the cost of care and about the databases used to track quality. And so can you give some examples of these databases that are being uh, available or that's tracking the uh, cost of care, quality of care, especially as we move on into a whole new era of value-based care whenever it comes? Sure. Yeah, whenever it comes. <laughs> We've been saying it's coming for a long time, but whenever it comes. Uh, yeah, total cost of care was the was the question. I did uh, put a, a brief answer. Uh, there, unfortunately, there's not a single source of truth that you can go to for a patient-specific total cost of care. You have to have a collaborative arrangement with a payer. Uh, so I can give an example of a situation that I know of you know, that I'm we're personally directly involved with, with a payer that we have a risk-based contract with. And that risk-based contract gives our cardiologists some upside and very little downside right now on the total cost of care. And that payer has insights to that because they are the owner of the claims. So they get to see part A, part B, and part D claims, total cost of care. And in that arrangement, our cardiologists can, will get a report for each patient that's under that contract, what is the total cost of care for that patient for the window of time, whether you're looking at 90 days or a year, in this case, it's a full year. So we actually get access through that payer to that total cost of care. Unfortunately, even though uh, some states require, and I think Gardner may know this, that some states require the payers to open up the, the claims on a de-identified basis, you can't look at those claims on a per patient basis, unfortunately, for a longitude of time without the payers sharing that data with you. So. The way you do that is you have partnerships with payers, and that partnership with the payer opens up that that the, kind of that secret database of all the claims, and you get a, an opportunity to see the total cost of care. All right, so we're almost in the last three minutes. There is one quick question about should groups start PET before joining the PE group or not? Probably that's more group specific and rather not go into like more details within that uh, kind of nuances of each practice. So I just want to finish up first, thanking all of you for great discussion and insight. Again, uh, this opened kind of a discussion on different perspectives of practice patterns. And again, the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology does not take a position on best practice or best path for individual practices. But what we wanted to do is really to bring perspective on this topic, especially as it is uh, moving, uh, making the way through the practices of cardiology. We wanted to promote dialogue on this. And ASNIC is really here to support its members through education. And I just want to highlight, we talked a lot about PET today, and I want to highlight some of the educational activities that we are putting together for uh, uh, cardiac PET in specific. We have a PET intensive workshop coming up for February 10 to 12. Also, we have another one dedicated to our technologists, so especially for these practices where cardiologists are coming up and uh, joining uh, a PET workshop and their technologists want to learn how to do nuclear cardiology. We have a dedicated workshop for technologists. All of these are virtual, so no need for travel. We're also putting, as we modernize our labs and acquire spec CT and PET CT work, uh, uh, machines, we're putting a hybrid imaging workshop, which will be in March 31st to April 2nd, and also virtual to kind of educate our cardiologists about uh, nuclear cardiology and the utility of hybrid imaging in these practices. And finally, on a positive note, we want to finish up. ASNIC is turning 30 years, and there will be a big celebration on January 31st. So join us for the party and we're having a big announcement at that one. We're going to feature the uh, first president of ASNIC, Dr. Lepo, and Dr. Marcelo Ducarli, who's the incoming editor-in-chief of the Journal of Nuclear Cardiology to talk about the past and the future of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. So with this, I'm gonna stop sharing and I wanna thank you again for all the audience, for all the attendee and the panelists 
for great remarks and thank you and uh, have a good evening.